also want to thank Nora Tyrittick, Frank Perry, Lisa Quartino, and others in the court who, are, who have made this possible for us. Today, we're pleased to have as our featured speaker, Judge McElroy. Our program will begin with some comments from Judge McElroy, and then we'll open it up for questions. Um, first, a bit of background about Judge McElroy. Judge McElroy is a native Rhode Islander. She received her undergraduate degree from Providence College before going on to receive her law degree from Suffolk Law School. After law school, she clerked for Justice Shea of the Rhode Island Supreme Court. From that time until her appointment to this court, she has devoted her virtually her entire legal career working as a public defender representing indigent clients before state and federal courts. She began that career with the Rhode Island Public Defender's Office and then uh, moved to the Federal Defender's Office where she was an assistant federal defender for the districts of Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and New Hampshire, uh, often appearing before the court over which she now presides. After that, she returned to Rhode Island in 2006 to the Rhode Island Public Defender's Office where she took the lead of that office and was the first woman to serve in that position. She held that position until, she, uh, until her appointment to the federal court in late 2019. And just one word about that appointment as those of us who practice in federal court are well aware, Judge McElroy is probably the only federal judge in, in my memory to have been nominated three separate times by presidents of different parties in a process that took four years to get to a confirmation hearing. Thankfully, that process was ultimately concluded and Judge McElroy is here with us today to speak with us about her experience on the court. Thank you so much, Judge McElroy, for being with us. Thanks for having me. That was, um, it was actually four years and two days, I think, <laughs> <laughs> or three days. Somebody else calculated it. But um, thanks for having me. I think we originally were scheduled to be here um, last year, but then, um, as you may or may not have heard, we've had a pandemic, so things have changed a bit. Um, it's nice to see everybody. Some people are familiar from the last few months. Some people I haven't seen in many years and others I have not yet met in person. So it's nice to see everyone. Um, I, I don't know what else I can say about myself. I've been on the bench since October of 2019. And so I was only here about five months when um, the world sort of shut down and I was just really getting my, well, I felt like I was getting my feet under me and then I had to learn to do things um, a bit differently, as we all have. Um, it's been a learning experience for all of us. Um, one of the things I learned is that some of the stuff that we do in person, um, we can do remotely, and that that may make um, lawyers, particularly um, people who have other things going on in their life, whether it's elderly parents or a spouse who's ill or children, um, it might make things easier sometimes to consider those things I'm hoping, and I, I know I've expressed this to the court, not that we have any local say about hearings, but I'm hoping to continue to do as many things as make sense and are allowed um, remotely, as long as people want that. I also recognize the need to you know, um, sort of have human contact, so um, it, it would be nice to see people in person again, too. Um, I looked at my sign-in sheet from my office and actually the last party group of people to sign in was the day, March uh, 13th of 2020. So I just took it off the sheet so that we can frame it at some point. Um, but, uh, it, you know, it, it's been a tough, it's been an interesting year. Um, uh, I see that, or I did see that Lara Montecalvo is on here somewhere and Lara is the current public defender. Um, and it is, you know, it was a job that I loved as an attorney, whether it was in district court originally, in superior court, um, in federal court, um, or running the agency. I, I will say the one experience I had arguing an appellate case I didn't love, and that was nothing to do with the judges or the court or anything. It's just, um, it's a different experience. So. Um, but to those of you who do that, my hat's off to you. Um, and so it's been an interesting year. I love the idea um, or the, the experience of getting to know a whole bunch of different areas of the law, the fun thing, so to speak, although my kids would make fun of me for saying, calling it fun, is getting to be a generalist. You know, one day 
delving into uh, criminal cases and, and search and seizure issues. And another day working on something with admiralty issues that I never addressed or never thought I would address. So I find all of it fascinating. Um, I feel that if I had a um, hundred hours a day to read, I still wouldn't know as much as I need to know or want to know. So um, it's been nice getting to re-meet people who I knew from you know, when I was in law school um, and to, to meet some new people. So thanks for having me. And I don't know if there's anything else you wanna know. I'm, I ran a fairly laid back chambers, I think. Um, I'm not always um, the most formal. So if that puts you off, I apologize. Um, but I'm also, you know, I, the one thing that I, I really um, sort of stress is being courteous to each other. There are times where, you know, we all want to scream at each other. And I just, you know, I think that, you know, for the most part, this is important, but it's not important enough to be intentionally mean to others. <laughs> so I try not to be mean to anybody who appears in front of me. And I hope that you treat each other with respect. Um, and that's basically all an introduction to, to my year on the bench. I expect this next year to actually meet some of more of you in person, um, providing that things keep going the way they are. So I know Stacy said she wanted to open it up to questions. So I'm going to yeah. turn it back to her. And we, we're, we can do that. I uh, just ask that people use the raise hand um, toggle on their Zoom device. And uh, Lisa will see that you're brought forward and you can address your question to the judge. Maybe while we're waiting for those to come in, Judge, I'll, um, I'll kick it off with a, okay. sure. maybe a predictable question, but a good one. So far, what, what's your favorite part of being a judge? And, and maybe share with us what is not so great. So I would say my favorite part of the two, uh, two favorite parts, getting to, you know, the bar in Rhode Island is small, but the criminal bar is even smaller. So getting to meet a whole bunch of people that either I didn't know before or I knew from back when I was um, clerking or working um, at Tate and Elias for a year, um, getting to see those people again, getting to meet a lot of new people. Um, and honestly, the thing that I, I think I like the best about being a judge is getting is having the opportunity to learn different things, to read something, have no idea what people are talking about, and then go through it and, and learn about that area of the law or that aspect of a case. So um, those are the things I like the best. The le it is isolating. Um, it's hard to, to say that's a, a, a downside to this job because I think this whole, I mean, everybody's been isolated for the last 14 months. Um, and I think that as we sort of re-enter society, um, you know, we almost have to learn to interact with each other again in person and, um, and we'll do that. But I think that might be the thing I dislike the most. Um, but I think we all have that experience this year. So hopefully we'll all come out of it together and be a little more social, maybe, or less. Great. Um, Peter Margolis, you're up. Margolis. Great, thanks very much. Judge, my question is about criminal law and specifically punishment in criminal law. Uh, there... oh, I'm afraid you're freezing up. No been a, a bit in the news recently about for restorative justice. And I wondered if you have any thoughts about using restorative justice uh, in your cases and, and how do you think that would work out as an alternative to, let's say, incarceration? So um, you broke up a little bit in there, but I think I understand what you were asking. Um, so, you know, it, punishment, is one of the most difficult things I found on the criminal side to do. I actually found criminal cases to be more difficult for me than civil cases, which I find, which is interesting since I've devoted most of my career to that. But um, you know, punishment should have a purpose and, and we all know what the law says about punishment. Um, but I think that no, I don't think that anyone would make the argument that the way that we punish people in the last 50 years or so in the United States has been super effective. Um, so I think that any attempt to 
um, put uh, a different perspective forward. For example, you know, restorative justice or um, specialty courts that that work. I know in, in this district, the Hope Court and the defer. Uh, I call it, it's DSP. What is it? Deferred sentencing program are ways of looking at um, uh, what drives people into the criminal justice system. You know, as public defenders, I used to advocate that we should separate out the sort of basic three of punishment, which would be time to in incarceration, time on probation or parole, and then other sort of programs and really have each of them have a purpose. So, and I think restorative justice is something that um, it makes a lot of sense in many cases. I don't think it always makes sense, um, but I think that it's something that I'm hoping the federal court would move toward. And I would be interested in, um, you know, in, in talking about those things and seeing if there's a way to, to pilot that here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Judge, I wonder if there were um, specific experiences from your past career that you think have best prepared you for your current role as a judge. So I think, you know, um, I think one of the things about being a public defender um, is that it's you're often taking a position um, and arguing a position that maybe personally isn't um, what you would argue. You know, if we were going to go out and have a glass of wine, I wouldn't necessarily say, hey, that guy shouldn't um, be punished or whatever because of the fault. But you take a position that is an advocate, as an advocate, as we all do in any case, whether it's criminal or civil, and you advocate for a position that um, doesn't necessarily comport with your personal beliefs. But in a criminal context, and particularly in a public defender context, it's often, you're often the person everybody's mad at, um, whether it's the judge, the prosecutor, the um, uh, witnesses, the defendant, his family, her family. Um, so I think being in a position where you do what's right, regardless of what people sort of think of you afterwards, I think that's the best preparation. And, um, and, and I think that it's still, no easier than it was as a first year PD, but you learn to deal with it and um, you learn to sort of uh, move along and, and not think too, too much about um, how people feel about you in the moment, I guess. I think you're muted, Stacy. Samuel Bletchley, you have a question? Yes, um, uh, Your Honor, uh, thank you for your time today. Um, you mentioned Admiralty, um, mm -hmm. and I see uh, Mr. Fulwiler and Mr. Cusick on the call as well, who are well-known Admiralty lawyers. Um, my question to you, Your Honor, is do you prefer that if there's a discovery dispute that we f file a letter with the court, email it to the clerk, or just file the motion to compel or something like that? What is your preference on that, Your Honor? That's my question. So that's a good question. And I can't say that I've um, really established a firm protocol for that. I, I expect everyone to, um, ex to confer first um, and, and not um, just come to me with every discovery dispute. I think that's part of my standing order and certainly it may be the local rules, Nora probably knows better. Um, if in the event it, it's unresolvable, um, sometimes a letter is helpful. There are times where I have a discovery dispute conference and I don't know what the dispute is until we're on that um, uh, phone call or Zoom. Um, and, I, and I also think that realistically having to put something pen to paper and spell it out, um, if, if you started off with four or five disagreements, you might realize that, well, two of them are kind of silly. And you know, I can help you resolve the other two or if necessary, make orders. So I think a short letter doesn't have to be anything formal, obviously that you share with opposing counsel um, and emailed to um, my um, case manager is probably the most helpful way to do it. I haven't ordered that in any case, but that's what I would prefer just so I have some understanding of what you're fighting about before or disagreeing about before you come 
to see me. If thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Judge Gapjip, um, before we get to Mark, I see a question in the chat room from Tom Lyons, who uh, would like to know where you stand on resuming trials following up on the court's conference last month. Um, I, I don't know if he's referring to civil or criminal or trial. So I think we're resuming in-person trials in June. That's the plan. Um, and obviously, you know, we, Frank and Nora and Judge Smith and everybody has kind of, um, uh, they've done a tremendous amount of work. I, I think the safest place to be is federal court because they know their stuff. They've known, and, and Judge Smith and Frank have been working on this for a year um, or more. And they've known the virus more than we did. They've known um, more than I did. Um, you can read as much as you want. And I don't think you can potentially have read as much as they've read on it. We've done testing. We've had, um, and by testing, I mean uh, COVID testing. We have um, uh, protocols where you, to come into the courthouse, you have to answer a, um, you know, like you would with anything else. And for those of you who have kids in school, you have to sign off that they haven't been exposed, but we also have temperature checks. Um, they know the air exchange rates in different courtrooms. Um, I think Mark has done an in-person trial or two um, and they were done in the jury um, assembly room, which I think is our biggest, most spacious room. I impaneled a grand jury a couple of weeks ago in courtroom one. And it's just, it, they've done an outstanding job of, I think, of, I feel safe. I mean, I am fully vaccinated at this point, so I feel even safer now. But I think that, um, you know, I think we should, we are going to resume jury trials. Um, and I, I just don't know what our capacity will be for getting everybody a jury trial immediately. But I intend to try to move some of these cases along because I think people have been waiting, so. Um, Mark, you have a question? I sure do. Uh, thanks, Judge. Uh, Mark. Any uh, uh, helpful hints or tips on generally on, you know, our motion practice, dispositive motion, what you look for either in writing or arguments, you know, nonspecific, but. Right. What, um, what can... So thank you. That's been, that's been one of the um, more difficult things to get used to is um, so much writing. Honestly, frankly, you don't, I don't, I didn't do a tremendous amount as a um, public defender. So especially in state court, um, the, it's helpful to have the issues um, sort of outlined with the factual scenario that I need to understand. Um, a lot of times people don't file um, statements of undisputed facts with dispositive motions, with summary judgment motions, and they don't respond. So, uh, you know, I, I know most people file them when they're supposed to. Some people don't. And that makes things a little more difficult for us. Um, I'm fortunate in that I have three law clerks. So I've had the um, luxury of having three people to sort of go through these things. But I think the statement of facts, um, disputed and undisputed facts is really important. A short statement at the beginning of a, a memo telling, just sort of highlighting to me what you want me to focus on, I find very important. And if you really need an argument, most cases I've been letting people have an argument because I feel that if your case is either gonna be dismissed or, or be sent to trial, you have a right to have me listen to it. There are very few cases I've decided just on the papers. Um, and so I think, you know, focusing me in on the one or two issues that you think are your strongest um, in the memo, and then again, an argument is probably the most helpful. Thank you. Judge, are you likely to you. hear those motions yourself? Or when are there instances when you refer things to the magistrate judges for initial report? So I've heard them myself. Um, and I haven't, for a few reasons, I haven't referred anything to them. I haven't referred those types of motions for a report to the magistrate judge, except maybe in one or two um, cases. And that's for a few reasons. One, I was new at it and I felt like I needed to hear them, review them and, um, and write them 
in, in, at the points where it was necessary. Um, the second thing is when I took this, when I was sworn in, this seat had been empty for four years, for more than four years. And the magistrate judges and the other judges had taken on huge um, burdens, caseloads. Um, and then with the pandemic, our magistrate judges have been doing um, so many hearings remotely. They've been doing um, mediation in all of our civil cases that look like they're gonna go to trial for the most part. Um, so we've really, I've overburdened them. I feel like I've overburdened them. So I haven't had, um, I haven't typically sent these things to the magistrate judges. As things get a little more normal, um, for lack of a better word, I may send some that way um, for hearings and for a decision, for reports and recommendations, but it, take, it adds an extra step for somebody to do the second step of work, you know, so. Um, Lauren Zurier has noted that um, you recently sat on the First Circuit. Yep. And she wondered if you had any thoughts or experiences about that that you wanted to share. So um, I don't see Lauren on my screen, but hi, Lauren. Um, yes, it was, I mean, you know, it's a lot of work. They sent me two huge bankers boxes to my house of briefs and appendices that um, my daughter who's 15 said, you have to read all of that. <laughs> I was like, yes, I do. Um, but so it's work, um, but it's interesting. Um, it is, uh, it shows you how important, I think being very specific with arguments um, at a trial level are. That's one of the things that, um, you know, that I've learned is that Sometimes attorneys think that their argument is pretty clear and maybe it's not as clear. Um, I said to one of the other judges that when I was a practicing attorney, I always thought if I was a judge, I would have all the time in the world. I would never be behind or, you know, and, and, um, and the judge who was an appellate judge said to me, I used to think that too. And then when I was a trial judge, I thought the same thing. And now as an appellate judge, and then I thought that about appellate judges. So I think it's just a matter of, it was a lot of work. It was incredibly interesting. Um, it's a different way of making a decision. You're not making the decision yourself. You're making the decision um, collaboratively with other judges, which is, you know, for those of you who've been public defenders or are public defenders or sole practitioners, public defenders don't really run anything by anybody except their clients. I mean, you can make any argument. You don't have to ask um, somebody above you usually to, uh, is this okay? Or can I make this deal or whatever? I mean, aside from your client who only has certain things that they get to decide is a very independent sort of um, undertaking and, and district judge, I think by yourself sort of is, that's a little more collaborative, um, but it was, it was a good experience. But again, Lauren, a lot of work. Um, appellate attorneys are pretty amazing. My one appellate experience, well, I, my one arguing experience as an appellate attorney was in the First Circuit um, many years ago, and it made me realize that it's a lot harder than it looks, <laughs> so. Uh, switching gears, um, Samantha Primo, and I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing your name incorrectly, asks, um, what advice do you have for attorneys fresh out of law school or clerks who are about who are practicing now in the federal court. Um, so, so to practice in the federal court or just generally? Uh, actually, it was addressed to practicing in federal court, but. Okay. Um, so I think that it's really good to remember that there are a lot of people with a lot of experience practicing in the federal court and almost all of them are willing to take a few minutes to guide you if you need some help pick up a phone and say, and call someone. It's a hard thing to do. Um, and I thought I saw Bob Mann here. When I was first a public defender, I remember ask, running into him in the hallway because I didn't know what to do in a case and saying, I don't know what to do. And he took about 20 minutes. I was in the middle of a trial. I don't even remember which trial it was and walked me through my options. And um, it meant a lot, obviously. It's something I still remember. Um, and I think that 
that it's a good thing to remember that even though these people are at people whose names you've probably heard since you were a child, um, or certainly since you were much younger, that you feel comfortable reaching out to people. Most people are going to welcome um, the questions, even if they're not people you practice with directly. And that goes for um, the public defender's office. I'm sure other um, people in uh, small practices or larger practices. So I think it's important to remember to do that. The advice I would give generally to people beginning the practice of law is that when things are going well, people don't get together and hire a lawyer. So remember that you're dealing with people at the worst moments in their lives and that the, a lot of that stress comes back at you over time and you have to find ways to deal with it um, that are productive and that are not harmful to yourself. Um, people don't say, you know, I guess, I suppose I've always said, except for adoptions, there's not really like, yeah, let's all go find a lawyer. So, um, you know, you got to remember that nobody's happy when they come to you, generally speaking, and that some of that will eventually burden you. So you'll find ways to deal with that. So. And I would just add, Samantha, the court has been really proactive in trying to provide training and opportunities for younger lawyers in particular. Um, in the world we live in now, where many lawyers don't have that institutional mentorship of a larger firm, and one of the ways the court has addressed it is through the Litigation Academy, um, which if you haven't, aren't familiar with it, you may want to look at it. I think they're planning on, hopefully, knock on wood, a program in the fall, but it's a tremendous program with um, highly experienced lawyers and judges sitting in and critiquing and, and giving you advice on various trial skills. So that's one program. And the Board of Bar Admissions and Education, um, which is hosting this event, will also be hosting other um, sort of practical skills types programs that you might want to keep um, an eye out for, which will usually have a judge or magistrate judge involved. Um, it's a very friendly court, um, and Judge Malcolm Roy is clearly going to advance that that culture of um, cooperation and openness to the bar. I think we're all getting that feeling already, Judge. <laughs> I hope so. Um, you, you mentioned, um, which isn't surprising, that it's 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 not great to see lawyers um, fighting with each other, getting kind of mean with each other. Do you have you noticed any other? conduct or do you have any other sort of pet peeves about um, things you've observed since in the time you've been on the bench about how lawyers have behaved or other sort of words of caution to us? Not really um, anything. People are generally very professional, very polite. Um, as long as you're treating your co-counsel or opposing counsel um, politely and respectfully and not doing things intentionally to try to gain an advantage that's unfair, you know, that's, I don't really have any pet peeves. I will want, warn you, which I think I warned people early on. I had a case very early on in the Zoom days and um, it, I'm somebody who's prone to probably more of this than anybody else. So I'm just, when I was practicing law, like either huffing or rolling your eyes, if you're on camera, it's really up close and personal and <laughs> the judge can see you. I personally don't take it, uh, take offense, e even if you intend it. So, um, uh, but um, others might. So just with Zoom, you might want to be careful <laughs> about that. Like, you know, or saying things before you're sure your microphone is off. It doesn't bother me. Um, I've said, I'm sure things that judges have overheard or the staff has overheard that have probably been um, not as, uh, as polite as they should be. So um, just remember though, that people can see you and that if you're not appearing before me, you might not want to huff him roll your eyes. Um, so that's all. Um, that's my word of caution. We have a question from John Fulweiler. I don't know if I pronounced that right. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, quick question. I've really found uh, the Zoom depositions and the use of Zoom in a practice especially a smaller practice like ours to be really efficient, effective. 
And is that something that you, your courthouse is, is, do you sense would continue? Is, is that as an alternative to, 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 uh, to the in-person aspects? You're talking about depositions within a case or about hearings and? I like it all, but the depositions in particular. So I don't know what the rule is with respect to that, Nora, whether we can just continue that or not. It's certainly something that I noticed when I came to the bench here that often people would come um, for a five minute conference or a 15 minute conference. And while that's not so horrible in Rhode Island, there would be people who would fly in on civil cases for that. Um, I think that's crazy. It's crazy from the perspective of litigation costs and time. It's crazy from the perspective of people have lives that don't necessarily, aren't necessarily conducive to that, of driving people out of the practice of law. And, and frankly, it's crazy from an environmental perspective. Why do we need to fly somewhere when we can do it by um, Zoom or by phone? So my personal preference would be to do more that way, particularly as long as parties agree. I don't know what the court rules will be with respect. And I don't think we have a say with respect long-term and by we, I mean the district of Rhode Island long-term for hearings and things, but I'm open to any way that makes things you know, easier for people to practice law, I, you know, particularly sensitive to people who have young children and you, know, you, you don't need to, to um, fly across the country, but also if your children are hybrid school or half hybrid school or whatever it is now, um, they sometimes are, it's better to be in the next room. So, and, and with elderly parents or whatever else there is, um, it's all the same to me. So maybe Nora, you. Nora or Frank might know better where we're at on that, but um, I just, yeah, I would love to have a conversation about what we can and can't do. And I would like to push the envelope and allow people to do as much as they agree to as conveniently as possible. Thank you. Judge, I'll just add that we've procured as a court Zoom for the next, for the foreseeable future. And it's up to every judge whether or not they want to continue to do Zoom um, in chambers conferences and things like that. But I think most of our judges are very comfortable with that for the same reasons that Judge McElroy just um, said. And as far as hearings are concerned, uh, criminal hearings were a little bit uh, constrained. So while the judicial conference has an emergency um, order in place, we can do Zoom conferences for criminal and civil, or Zoom hearings, sorry, for criminal and civil. And when they lift that, um, there will have to be a federal rule change in order for us to continue to do that because we're prohibited from broadcasting criminal cases. Um, but as far as civil cases are concerned, we're hoping to continue uh, many of our hearings and civil cases and civil matters via Zoom because uh, for all the reasons that the judge just stated. And, and if I can just add, and I don't know, wanna speak for the other judges in the court, but I, I think I can, that if it's something, if you have a case and you and the opposing counsel wanna do things by Zoom, by all means, reach out to me, to my case manager, just let me know. Um, and and it's fine with me. Um, it is, you know, something that took us leaps ahead, I think, in some of this stuff, maybe 10 years ahead of where we would be, but it, and we should keep the good aspects of it. Going back to normal means that people were driving into Providence for 15 minute conferences, finding a place to park, you know, um, expending time and energy that are just not necessary. I'd love to see you all. You're all welcome to come and have a cup of coffee, but if you don't want to, we can do things this way. So this may be a good moment for me to put a uh, pitch in for our next uh, event that we're going to be having that the Board of Bar Admissions and Education will be hosting on May 24, which is event talking about the considerations and best practices in conducting proceedings virtually. And specifically, it'll be addressed to depositions, arbitrations, uh, judicial um, so preliminary injunction or hearings, uh, and mediation, which brings a whole host of other concerns and considerations. The panel for that will be uh, Magistrate Judge Sullivan, uh, Matt Oliverio, and Robert Duffy. And that's on May 24th at noon. Um, there will be CLE credit and a notice will be going out. So just a little pitch there, but if you haven't taken a deposition virtually or conducted, I conducted a multi-day preliminary injunction hearing before Judge um, McConnell and it went well, but there's definitely additional things you need to think about that 
sometimes you don't think about till you're in that moment. So hopefully this um, this event is intended to help you um, identify those things um, so that you can be prepared as you head into those proceedings. Judge, you um, you mentioned that you have been allowing uh, argument on motions, and I wonder what um, maybe you could give us some pointers on what you look for. It sounds like you're very prepared and you read everything. So uh, when you can I try to be <laughs> when it's not too many bankers boxes full of documents. Um, but what was most helpful to you when the attorneys appear to argue a particularly a dispositive motion? Um, sort of, you know, one of the things, particularly with the dispositive motion is um, there are reasons you're moving to or objecting to, let's say, a motion for summary judgment. And if you don't need to spend 20 minutes outlining the history of the case and, you know, who filed what on what day, if it's not really relevant to that argument. And so while, you know, um, I like to be prepared, I'm not always perfectly prepared, um, but I have law clerks too who, you know, also have read all your papers, usually just one of my clerks, although sometimes in some cases more than one, but, um, and I've read them it is cut, I don't want to say cut to the chase, but like, you know, sort of give me a brief roadmap, but, you know, assume that we've read what you filed. Um, don't assume necessarily that we also know the history of how everybody in your town or in this company has been interacting for 20 years, if it's not part of the lawsuit, because we don't always have that kind of a history. Um, and just sort of get to the real crux of the argument. Also, if I ask a question and you either don't want to, which I've been there, or can't answer it, um, don't try to deflect. Just say either I don't know or I can't answer that or, um, you know, whatever euphemism you have for that so that, you know, we're not... Um, wasting time. I mean, I've had judges ask me, where's your client, you know, when, and, or did you give him or her notice? In a criminal case, you can't really answer that question um, without, you know, violating an attorney-client privilege. So that becomes difficult. So I get it when judges ask stupid questions, believe me, and I'm sure I've done it. Um, but, you know, you short of saying that's a stupid question, you can, you know, say, I can't answer that. I'm not going to be mad at you for saying that, so. And I, I did get some suggestions for some procedural questions, so I'm, I'm going to turn to some okay. of those. Do you have a standard uh, Rule 16 scheduling order that you use? So I think um, we generally have Rule 16 conferences with most cases, for most cases, unless um, there's a reason not to. I think the sort of default is six months, but I'd rather give you, I mean, six months for fact discovery and then time after that. I'd rather give you time up front. I hate um, artificial deadlines unless they're just, you know, sort of safeguard controls to keep, make sure everybody didn't forget this case existed, which can happen when you have a busy practice. Um, but, you know, if you know, and you've consulted with opposing counsel and you know this is going to take you know a year of fact discovery and then you're not going to need experts and that'll I'd rather have you do that than than ask for the six months and then come back and ask for two more months and ask for two more months um if there's some reason the only cases that may be a little bit different are when um you have attorney's fees that are accruing over time or things like that then you need to sort of keep an eye on those cases but be realistic. Um, I never liked judges who, when you would ask them for, you know, a month, they would say, I'll give you a week. And then you'd come back in a week and ask for three weeks. And then, you you know, it just, it wastes everybody's time. Be honest, be, uh, or, you know, um, realistic up front. So my standard would be six months, but I tend to have a phone conference with most of those cases. Um, that's what we've been doing as they get passed once they've been answered. Um, if you haven't had a conference and you feel like you want to, or you should, then just let us know. And it's probably me who dropped the ball. So I apologize. Do you require the either party to submit a summary of claims prior to the rule 16 conference? I know judge McConnell and judge Smith do that to a different degree. 
Yeah, we have a, um, we, I think we require the plaintiff to submit a rule 16 statement that just sort of outlines the basics. I don't need um, a million pages. Um, I just need to know sort of where this is going and how much time you think it's gonna take, what's involved. Um, by the same token, if you forget, it's not the end of the world. You can spend five minutes telling me about it at the, um, at the conference call. Um, apparently, John, whose last name I don't know, has a question and is having trouble raising his hand. Um, <laughs> John, I'm afraid I don't know how to respond to you. If you could tell me what your last name is. It's John Foley, Stacy. Sorry. Oh, John, there you are. Here I am. Sorry. Hi, that's uh, okay. Raise thanks. Uh, judge, <laughs> uh, Judge, I'm wondering if uh, you've had a chance to think about a policy on jury selection, specifically attorney involvement over the years. There's been some wide variation in how much involvement by the attorneys the different judges allow from limiting us to submitting written questions to handling it in state court where it's sort of all attorney um, uh, directed. So I'm wondering if, if you've had a, a policy on that yet. So I've only, I only had the opportunity to have one jury trial in a civil matter before, before the break and I, have a strong preference for attorney conductive voir dire. That's how I did things. That would be my inclination um, to ask the basic questions, more like a state court judge has, more like I think um, uh, Judge McConnell did or does. I don't know how he's, his practice has evolved, but um, my, I have a strong preference for, I'll ask the basics and then allow the attorneys the latitude to ask the questions that are appropriate to them for their case because that's how I did it in state court. And honestly, I found it difficult to adapt in federal court um, when I had to change that practice. But if there's a, you know, um, a case that requires a more nuanced approach and you'd rather have um, questionnaires or things like that, let's just talk about it ahead of time and, and figure out the best way to do it. But my preference is for attorney conducted voir dire. Thank you. Thank you, just made very many lawyers very happy with that. Really? I'm sure I made some not happy too. I remember at the time being happy when Judge McConnell said it, but there were a few people who were like, oh my God, he's going to make us do it. So, um, thanks, John. Um, Judge, what about uh, ADR or mediation? What, what's your sort of philosophy or approach to? Um, determining when a case should be referred and, and how you do it? So probably not surprisingly, um, I don't have a firm on um, you must do this by this date. Um, I think attorneys know when a case has had enough discovery or whether it needs some discovery before mediation makes sense. Um, and I'm happy usually at that, that Rule 16 conference for those of you who I've had them with, um, I'll ask if I, if I think of it, if I don't forget, I'll ask about referral either to the magistrate judge or to ADR. Like I said, the magistrate judges have been on uh, mediating, have been conferencing basically all of the civil cases that have been coming up for trial in order to try to uh, get, you know, to get cases to resolution that can be. Um, but I think it, it's best to get that done at an earlier date, but not so early that the facts aren't really um, out there and the people, the parties aren't really ready to think about resolution. So I think the attorneys generally know um, and usually agree, it's been my limited experience that yes, this needs to go to mediation right away, or you know what, we need to engage in some discovery first, um, or you know, there's no point in trying to mediate this at all ever which is rare, I think. And what about summary judgment practice? Uh, Judge Smith typically asks that the parties um, conference with him prior to filing a motion um, to, to determine whether it's warranted, appropriate. Um, do you have any feeling on that practice? Or yeah, I haven't done that. I haven't felt the need to do that um, again, and maybe my practice will change. Um, but I think that Attorneys know their cases. If there's if a motion for summary judgment is appropriate, then you should be able to file it. You shouldn't have to have my permission. That just adds another layer. It adds another cost. By the same token, if you think conference with the court would be helpful, 
I'm always available to, to talk things through. If you think it would be helpful to, you know, decide, okay, you know, should we file a motion for summary judgment? Um, sometimes it's not as clear, um, but I think that, that I haven't had any, put any restrictions on that. Um, I don't anticipate doing that. So unless, you know, if somebody has some great ideas, I'd be happy to hear them. But so far I have not done that. If you have a motion for summary judgment, uh, I anticipate that you'll file it and it'll get responded to and we'll address it. Also in our court, although it's been a while, we had judges who imposed page limits on certain types of motions and, and filings. Do you um, have any thoughts about that? Um, no, I haven't done that. I think, you know, there's no need to do that. There's also no need to give me a hundred pages on something that's really quite simple. Um, but, you know, you, I trust lawyers to know their case and know what it requires and, you know, file what they need to file and we'll hear it. It's very rare, I think, that people, um, you know, are going to just, you know, uh, put, you know, an extra 20 pages into a motion for no good reason. If it's there, it's because the law is difficult or complicated to explain or the facts are, and I need to know it. So I haven't done that. I don't anticipate doing it. If everybody files 150 page motions for summary judgment and responses tomorrow, then I will be doing it. <laughs> but I'm just <laughs> kidding. When when things even out and the, the magistrates get a little breather in, do you plan on um, referring more types of motions to them? Yeah, and I have. I don't want you to think that I haven't referred anything to them. I just haven't. Um, uh, it's not a. It's not something I've gotten used to yet so and i will i i had sat down with both of them um who both of our magistrate judges are incredible for those of you who you know i'm sure you all know them um they sat down with me in my first week here and went over every because i got you know a, a bunch of civil cases transferred to me but no criminal cases and so i started with 200 civil cases and they each went through their list of civil cases and said this case is at this point, you can refer this motion to me, don't, you know, you need to decide that one or whatever. And it was just incredibly helpful. So um, I, at some point, intend to probably reach out to both of them and just say, am I referring enough or not enough to you? Um, and what would you want me to do in that regard? Because I, because they know far, you know, they've been doing this for longer than I have. Um, and they're very expert at what they're doing both of them. It seems like um, gener in general, the court has become um, more, more open to kind of informal ways to diffuse discovery issues before they have to be reduced to full briefing, full informal briefing. Yep. Um, I, I know in particular, Judge McConnell in certain cases will invite a conference call before a motion. Judge um, Sullivan does that as well to matters assigned to her. Um, what, how do you feel about that? And I think kind of relates to that admiralty question you got earlier. Yeah. It, I would prefer to um, have people discuss them and then have a conference with me before they file a motion. And I think that's been my practice. Um, I think that it saves, it allows us to pare down what the issues really are. You know, um, I find that often for the, for the ones that I've had, and it hasn't been that many over the year and a half, but um, when we get to the conference, at times people will say, well, we've already resolved it. But at other times um, they'll say, well, we've resolved one, two, and three, and we need some help or guidance with four or five, you know? And so it does allow us to pare things down. And then the conference allows us to pare things down further. And then, you know, some things have to have motion practice. That's, that's part of life. And that's part of, you know, um, one of the things, and not to keep going back to my own experience, but there are times in, criminal cases where judges would say to me, well, don't you agree, blah, blah, blah. And I might think, well, yeah, but I can't say that, you know? <laughs> so um, personally, sure, I agree with you, but, you know, legally and, and, and formally, no. So I get that there are times where things just have to be decided by a court and that's fine. That's, that's part of life. We don't need to belabor them. We don't need to make them more complicated than they are. So if we can just kind of all pare it down that way by you two, by the parties discussing it, by then having an informal sort of discussion with the court. And usually we set those up by telephone 
um, well, obviously always now, but I'm happy if there's a lot of parties to have a Zoom conference, I'm happy to have in person when life goes back to some normal, if you think that's helpful, um, but we can have a conference anytime somebody wants. And then if they can't be resolved, we need to file a motion. We'll deal with it. Great. Matt Parker. Oh, you're on mute, Matt. I think you unmuted me and then I had muted it back by accident. Sorry about that. Um, so uh, a related question, Your Honor, I know a lot of the practitioners who've been around for a while in federal court, um, you know, they see the initials come across in the case caption. They're all right, this is a Judge McElroy case and Magistrate Judge Sullivan is attached to it too, you know, and they'll be in a deposition and some dispute will come up and they'll just reach right out to the magistrate judge's uh, case manager, you know, to try to set up a call that day, or um, there's some potential motion to compel, you know, on a, a document discovery issue, and they'll just reach out to the magistrate, um, never wanting to step on your honor's toes. Um, and, and hearing that the magistrates are swamped right now, should we go first to your case manager or continue going to the magistrates with that sort of thing? You should continue doing what you're doing. Um, and unless and until the magistrate judges tell me they don't want you to do that, that's fine. If that's been the practice, I think that's perfectly fine. I didn't mean to imply that they're so swamped that they can't do anything else, but I feel like I've burdened them just because I did, you know, they have more work to do with a third judge. They have more work to do um, with cases that getting me up to speed on things. So, um, and it's been the pandemic. They've been the people who I think have borne the, the brunt of the extra work that the pandemic has put into place. But if what you're doing works, then by all means, continue it. If for some reason somebody says, first of all, I never feel offended. You can call anybody else you want. I don't mean never. I mean, you know, not on those kinds of things. Um, so call whoever you want. I'm not offended that you didn't call me, believe me. Um, and if for some reason it becomes too burdensome for them, they'll tell me or somebody else will. And so um, if that's been your practice, I say go for it. It seems to be working. Thank you. Thanks. We're just about out of time. I want to just leave a moment to see if anybody had any other questions. Seeing none. I want to thank you, Judge McElroy. Thank you. Oh. Thanks for having me. I hope that I answered some of your questions. It was, so. it was worth the year's wait in pandemic. I don't know about that, but <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's been nice to see everybody. Take it easy. Be safe. And I just want to tell everyone to get your CLE credit. If you didn't notice, um, Lisa Portino has posted her email address. You just need to email her with your bar number, name, and she'll get the certificate to you. Thank you, Stacy. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Judge. Thank you. Thanks, Nora.